We at Appleby College acknowledge that these lands on the shores of Lake Ontario are steeped in Indigenous history. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Anishinaabeg peoples. Most recently, it has been part of the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. We acknowledge and thank the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation for being stewards of this traditional territory. Hi, students of Appleby College. My name is Archdeacon Val Kerr. I'm the Archdeacon of Truth, Reconciliation and Indigenous Ministry for the Anglican Diocese of Niagara. I have been with you in person in the past, but because of COVID, we're now having to take things. You are going to be going home soon. So you will be home by the time National Indigenous Peoples Day arrives on June 21st. So I'm going to do a short reflection on why we celebrate National Indigenous Peoples Day or in some cases, National Indigenous Day of Prayer in our churches. When you think of Indigenous people, what do you think of? I thought what I would do is share just a little bit of the information of my personal family. I come originally from Tyendinaga, which is east of Belleville, Ontario. And I am Mohawk from the Wolf Clan. I have a very large family and certainly a very large family of cousins. So some of the things that my cousins do in their journey on this Mother Earth is we have in our family three doctors, we have a nurse practitioner, we have a lawyer, we have many who are teachers both in public schools and in colleges and universities. We have a number of people who work for the federal government in the uh, Department of Indian Affairs. So we are very diverse in our family, as many families are. I'm sure your family is diverse too. And my prayer for all of you is that you do some research about Indigenous peoples and see what gifts they bring to Canada and what gifts they have brought through the, through the generations because there have been many gifts. Many Indigenous people are artists. They're storytellers. Some of our, our people are known to be metal workers who make high-rise buildings. They work in construction. They work in all kinds of areas, just like your ancestors did. Some were farmers. So look at your history and see what you celebrate about your cultural background and really do some celebration on this National Indigenous Peoples Day. The Dish With One Spoon is a concept created by the Indigenous people of Turtle Island. The concept is often used for treaty making and it means that something, most often land, can be shared with everyone benefiting. If each person takes the spoon and only draws out that which they need, then there's enough to go around for all. According to the Haudenosaunee people, this concept came to be when the Iroquois Confederacy was being formed. The Anishinaabe people call a dish with one spoon, du nanganina. The dish representing the land being shared and the spoon representing the individuals who use the land's resources. Another important part of treaty making were the wampum belts, beaded belts which signified the coexistence of two people. Often during times of celebration following the creation of a tree, wampum belts were exchanged and these belts would have depictions of the dish and the spoon on them. When European settlers came to Turtle Island, they weren't really able to understand the principle because of their belief in privately owned property. 
This was also cause for confusion during the treaty negotiations and creations because indigenous people believed they were agreeing to share their land, whereas settlers believed that they were agreeing to purchase it. Today, the dish with one spoon concept is widely used in conversations about sustainability. The main concept of the principle is that one should only take what is necessary and leave enough for others, and so it lends itself to talks of using the land sparingly and with thought for future generations. This is an incredible age-old concept from Indigenous people, and I think that the entire world could benefit if we all stopped and considered how we are a part of this dish with one spoon. My life began to more deeply intersect with the Canadian story of reconciliation in the late 1990s and early 2000s and was also part of my discernment and training to be an Anglican priest. At this time, a lawsuit for past abuses in residential schools in the interior of BC was launched with wide-reaching impact for Anglicans throughout British Columbia and Canada. The lawsuits initially brought against the Canadian government and the government brought in the churches, as many schools were run in partnership with Anglican, Roman Catholic and United Church of Canada missionaries. Through, throughout my training and involvement with the Anglican Church, I began to hear about the true scope and impact of Christianity and colonialism on Indigenous Canadians. I will never forget a class when one of our lecturers, Reverend Dr. Wendy Fletcher, laid out in detail her findings of the abuses perpetuated at the Mohawk Institute in Ontario. It was horrifying. Throughout the lecture, she reminded us that these were the abuses that were documented. The food served that was not fit for human consumption. The discipline that was imposed. Whatever we might imagine about the horrors and abuses that occurred in the residential school, the research and documentation of what we do know means it was likely much, much worse. Soon after finishing my seminary training and being ordained, I moved to New Zealand in 2007. When I left, the lawsuits had just been settled and one of the outcomes was the formation of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I'll be honest, I was not hopeful for reconciliation. My concern was that younger Canadians, who never lived while the residential schools were operating, would not understand the need for reconciliation. I was wrong, but I'll get to that later. Living in New Zealand also opened my eyes to what was possible regarding relations with Indigenous Canadians. When I returned to Canada in 2015, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was just completing its work and set to release the 94 calls to action. What really stunned me, however, was the change in attitude primarily with younger Canadians. Almost universally, there was at least some recognition that past colonial abuses needed to be addressed. And this is what gives me hope. There's a recognition that the only path forward for all of us is a path of truth and reconciliation. We need to have the courage to face up to the truth of our past, the devastating impact of colonialism on First Nations, Métis and Inuit. As I was writing this talk, news came of the discovery of 215 undocumented graves of children who attended a residential school in Kamloops, British Columbia. This is yet again the painful truth of past injustices and abuses that we must face up to. Without facing our truth of our colonial past, there can be no reconciliation. And it's reconciliation that comes with doing the hard work found in the 94 calls to action. This is a long and difficult road. Colonialism and white supremacy are still the dominant mode of thinking in Canada. Systemic racism against First Nations making Inuit people is still very strong in all parts of our country. To deny that, is to not deny the truth that we must face. Yet, as I said, I am hopeful. I am hopeful for a future of Canada where we dismantle the impact of our colonial past. In the Hebrew Bible, the prophet Amos proclaimed this, Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Put another way, words are not enough. We need to put in the difficult work of reconciliation, where we move towards a new partnership built on mutual cooperation and understanding, where there is justice and equity for all. This, I believe, is our only path forward.
Thoughts and a prayer for the 215 children found. We pray that our children find their way back home to the Creator, that they are not forgotten and their families no rest. Each time we look upon the feet of an innocent child walking with their shoes untied, we will remember. We give an oath to the Creator to do better for the safety of our fellow beings, never to force our will or our ways onto another. Creator, make rest to our hearts by making sure we never repeat again this painful act of loss. Rest now, children, on your journey home. In the path of souls, the Milky Way, you are again starlight, being carried home on the river of stars. May we meet again to share a meal as you are not forgotten and are always in our thoughts and our prayers. Miigwech.